Tonight, one month on, as Israeli troops battle with Hamas in Gaza, how the conflict is dividing communities here in Scotland. I have seen angry women come out and swear at children, calling them terrorists. There are the, the actual things that are happening, and then there's just the fear that something bigger might happen. Also making the headlines, taking action after the bonfire night disorder. Arrests, attacks and animal deaths prompt growing calls for a firework ban. Passengers are facing huge disruption on fuss buses in Glasgow. More than a thousand drivers plan a week-long strike. And what might be in Santa's sack? Barbie, Harry Potter and a digital dog. Just some of the top toys this Christmas. I'm Kellyanne Woodland in Edinburgh. And I'm John Mackay in Glasgow. This is the STV News at six. Good evening. A month on from Hamas's attack in Israel, the conflict between both sides shows no sign of resolution. Thousands of Palestinians are fleeing into southern Gaza after running out of food and water in the north, according to the United Nations. Israel has announced its troops are battling Hamas deep inside Gaza City. Here in Scotland, it's forcing communities who live alongside each other to take sides. And there's rising concern about both anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. Well, our reporter Vanessa Taff is in Glasgow's George Square for us. And Vanessa, there's a vigil there tonight. Yes, Kellyanne, people are beginning to gather here this evening. And really, they're gathering to share their grief. A lot of people are desperately affected by what's been happening in Gaza and Israel as well. Of course, I've been speaking to both sides of this divisive conflict. And the one thing that they all share is their grief and their sense of loss and helplessness at what's happening. I've been out in one community in Glasgow just to see how that's becoming and manifesting itself. In Glasgow's south side, signs of a conflict happening miles away aren't hard to spot. The talk between neighbours and friends here is about bringing an end to the fighting. The peace is the important thing for everyone. Even peace in your house, peace on your outside, peace everywhere, that's the main thing. If you have peace, that's your good life. As people go about their daily lives, there's a feeling of helplessness. It's sad to see, like, you know, no one's helping, no one's doing nothing about it. You know, even though everything's out there in the open for everyone to know, to see. This community hub has become a safe place for people to gather and process what's happening. Many fear hatred towards Muslims is on the rise. It is easy to target this neighbourhood especially. It's heightened that tension and what you'll find is in people who otherwise may not say things are feeling emboldened to come out. Angry people, I have seen angry women come out and swear at children, calling them terrorists. My friends that do adorn the hijab, they have been targeted verbally. Some of them have been physically assaulted as well, like with trying to, you know, grab their flag or their headscarves. And unfortunately, though, they've not gone to the police. And when I've probed them, why not? It comes back to the same thing of, first of all, if the police will take it seriously. And second of all, it's almost become like, well, that's the price we have to pay for what, for looking like us and for having our beliefs. Weekly pro-Palestine protests have been happening across the country. Some claim these are becoming more aggressive in nature and fueling division. Alongside her creative work, Sydney teaches young people about being Jewish. It's increasingly focusing on anti-Semitism. People are being more cautious about expressing their Judaism in public. I think that sometimes I just feel a little bit more uncomfortable if I'm in a space that is predominantly non-Jewish where they have oftentimes posters or they're doing fundraisers to, to aid Palestinian uh, refugees and, and people who are suffering in Palestine, which is of course something that I would support. You know, I think that, that providing medical aid and humanitarian aid is very important, but I think that the nuance is not always there. People are being forced to take sides now on whether they're in favour of a ceasefire or, or a humanitarian pause. 
And that's a question for moral philosophy seminars, I suppose. But ordinary people in the street are being forced to take sides. And that, as I said earlier, just makes matters even worse. Sewing up the sense of division between two communities will take time, but they all share a fear for what the future holds for Palestinians and Israelis. Vanessa Taff, STV News in Glasgow. The conflict in Gaza is also having a political impact here in the UK. To hear more about that, let's go to our Westminster correspondent, Paris Gutsianis. So, Paris, what's the latest? Well, Keir Starmer has suffered the first resignation by a shadow Labour minister over his stance against a ceasefire in Gaza. The Labour leader says a ceasefire would only help Hamas. Instead, he backs the UK government's position in favour of short humanitarian pauses. Now, that puts him at odds with Anas Sarwar, the Scottish leader, among others in his party. And emotions are running high. Mr. Sarwar says Mr. Starmer's comments have hurt British Muslims. And today, during a common statement on this, a shadow Labour minister burst into tears describing the suffering of civilians in Gaza. Now, the SNP is in talks with Labour backbenchers about forcing a vote on this in the Commons. That could be very awkward for Mr. Starmer. Scottish Labour figures accept that this is a difficult position for them politically, but they're also angry at what they see as the politicisation of a crisis. As long as the fighting continues, so will this headache for Labour. Paris at Westminster, thank you. A man has appeared in court accused of threatening and abusive behaviour on bonfire nights in Livingston. And there are now growing calls for a ban on the sale of fireworks. Meanwhile, a woman from East Lothian has told STV News how her dog died after being scared by the loud bangs. The night of unprecedented violence on Sunday saw eight police officers harmed in the Nidre area of Edinburgh, where the City Council is discussing measures, including control zones, to tackle the problem. Vanessa Kennedy has more. A much-loved family member, full of character. It was while out for a walk last Saturday evening that Saul became terrified at the sound of fireworks being set off in Dunbar. The explosions sent him into a frenzy. He reared up and in, in absolute panic and slipped this collar. He ran round here. The gates were closed. And in his panic, he then took off. Saul was sadly hit by a car and was later found dead. His owners are now calling for a ban on the sale of fireworks to the public. Fireworks have their place, it's a tradition and, and I understand that. But one day a year, and, and organised, and everybody knows and on that day, you, you have them with you at all times. It comes after bonfire night saw unprecedented levels of violence. Eight police officers were injured in the Nidri area of Edinburgh after fireworks, masonry bottles and petrol bombs were thrown. The leader of Edinburgh Council says there have been discussions about what measures can be put in place to avoid this ever happening again. The firework control zones were actively looking at and I personally think that we need to reconsider whether there's a need for the public sale of fireworks um, going forward and, and if not, our offer would be we would look to provide an organised displays across the city. The next few days and weeks will see officials from across the emergency services working with the council to discuss future preventative measures. But for Colette, any restrictions can't come soon enough. They've now had to bury their much-loved dog in his favourite spot in the garden and hope no one else has to lose their pet in such distressing circumstances. Vanessa Kennedy, STV News Dunbar. Other stories now and a consultation has been launched on legislation giving the Scottish Government more powers to assess and take action over potentially unsafe cladding on buildings. The bill would also see the creation of a cladding assurance register and a scheme which would put potential sanctions on developers who fail to comply. The consultation will run until December the 8th. Second, homeowners could pay up to double the full rate of council tax under proposed new rules. 
Draft regulations put before the Scottish Parliament would give local councils the power to apply the premium. Currently, second homes are subject to a default 50% discount on council tax. The new legislation would treat second homes like long-term empty homes from next April. And First Minister Hamza Yusuf will travel to Dubai for the COP28 climate summit later this month. He said he will use his visits to call on other nations to urgently step up to address the injustice at the heart of climate change by providing more support to poorer nations who are suffering the most from rising global temperatures. Scotland hosted the COP26 summit in 2021. The former head of the UK government civil service has apologised for suggesting chickenpox-style parties could be held during the early phase of the coronavirus pandemic. Lord Mark Sedwell told the UK COVID-19 inquiry he was looking at ways of managing the virus and protecting the most vulnerable. Lord Sedwell also said he was aware at the time that coronavirus was a far more serious disease than chickenpox. Our political correspondent Ewan Petrie reports. This inquiry has heard claims Lord Sedwell suggested to then Prime Minister Boris Johnson he should encourage chickenpox style parties to infect people with COVID. I swear by Almighty God. Today, the former Cabinet Secretary said the remarks were made before the decision had been taken to move towards a lockdown. These were private exchanges, um, and I certainly had not expected this to become public. And I, and I understand how, and in particular, the interpretation that's been put on it, that um, it must have come across that someone in my role was both sort of heartless and thoughtless about this. And, I'm, and I genuinely am neither. But I do understand the distress that must have caused, and I apologise for that because it certainly wouldn't have been my attention, and, it, and of course I wasn't the one who made it public. Lord Sedwell told the inquiry in the early stages of the pandemic the UK government and devolved administrations agreed on the need for restrictions. I think in that phase of the crisis, the alignment was striking. It became paradoxically more difficult later when the difficulty of the decisions was considerably less acute than it was at that phase going into the first lockdown. Although offering no formal advice to the Prime Minister to sack Health Secretary Matt Hancock, Lord Sedwell admitted he made his opinion clear. He would have been under no illusions as to my view uh, about what was best. You left, him, you left him under no doubt whatsoever that he would be better advised to replace Mr Hancock with another minister as Secretary of State for Health. Indeed. Tomorrow, the inquiry will hear from former Home Secretary Dame Priti Patel. Ewan Petrie, STV News. First bus drivers in Glasgow are to strike over Black Friday weekend in a dispute over pay. Unite the Union says its members voted by 99% in support of the action. Caitlin Hutchison reports. Well, it's one of the busiest shopping weekends of the year, Black Friday, in the lead up to Christmas. But that's the date that bosses at Unite the Union have chosen for strike action, kicking off at 4am on Friday the 24th of November and lasting until the same time the following week. They've warned it will cause massive disruption across Glasgow. 1,200 first bus drivers are taking part, some of them based here at the depot in Scotston, others at Blantyre, Caledonia, Overtown and Dumbarton. Now, it's off the back of them rejecting almost unanimously a pay offer described by the union as unacceptable. I mean, our members um, are on one of the lowest pay offers in the whole of the UK. We would ask that first bus management get around the table and improve that offer and give our drivers what they deserve. They're, they've been undervalued for years and years. In response, a spokesperson for First Bus said they're looking to continue discussions in a bid to reach a resolution, but insist they've already made a pay offer that would equate to over 11% for drivers. As it stands, though, the people of Glasgow can expect a heavily disrupted service on Black Friday weekend. Caitlin Hutchison, STV News. Four climate protesters who disrupted one of the biggest races during the UCI World Championships have been found guilty of breach of the peace. At Falkirk Sheriff Court, three activists from a campaign group were admonished, one left with a £250 fine. Brandon Cook reports. 
Katrina Roberts, Ben Taylor, Romain Mulan and Rebecca Kerr arrived at Falkirk Sheriff Court this morning to stand trial on allegations of breach of the peace. The prosecution alleged that the climate activists chained themselves together by the neck and glued themselves to the ground, blocking the UCI World Championships men's elite race as it was set to pass through Stirlingshire on the 6th of August. The Crown called three witnesses, all serving police officers. The first described receiving a radio report of four people in bushes on the B818 near Fintree. The officer said they stood out from other spectators. He said that he felt they looked dishevelled and got the impression that they may have been sleeping rough. When engaged, he said that they acted in a calm manner. He said that they then sat back on the road chained themselves together with a bike lock and glued themselves to the roads. In total, the cycling race was delayed for around an hour. All four from the protest group This Is Rigged accepted they committed the act but argued it didn't constitute a breach of the peace. Three of the accused took the stand as their own defence. One, Ben Taylor, compared his actions and the group's to that of the suffragettes. To that, the sheriff replied, but they were all convicted and none were acquitted using the argument of Act Now. All four were found guilty of breach of the peace, but the three women were admonished as it was their first offence. The man was fined £250 due to having multiple similar offences and breaching bail. Outside, they gave their reaction. I, I believe that being admonished is a, a surefire signal that we were not seen to be committing a violent offence, we were being peaceful, and that the extent of our actions was taken into account. Um, I don't think that um, the only reason we were admonished is simply because it was my first offence, or first offence. Brandon Cook, STV News, at Falkirk Sheriff Court. Philippe Clément says he wants to turn his Rangers team into a machine as he continues to implement his methods at Ibrox. Clément will take charge of his first European match at home against Sparta Prague tomorrow night, looking to build on their steady start to their Europa League campaign. Keeping a watchful eye of his squad ahead of Rangers' next challenge, Sparta Prague, in the Europa League tomorrow night. With four wins from five games, Philippe Clement is happy with his team's progress, but the Ibrox boss knows it's still early days. It's just a start. Uh, no, a good team for me is a team that does it for months. Of course, I'm happy how things are going, but I'm not like uh, sitting in the sofa and thinking, OK, now we can let everything loose and the machine will go. I want to create a machine. And I think it's possible with this group to create a machine who goes every time. Kima Roof returns to the squad for tomorrow night, but Scott Wright may miss out through injury. Jack Butland has impressed since joining Rangers in the summer, and the goalkeeper is looking forward to another night under the lights at Ibrox. We know what it's like when people have got to come and face us at home, so we know we're strong there. And I think as a team, we're growing in strength and belief that, that we can play anyone. Um, maybe that wasn't quite the feeling some time ago, but now it's certainly grow into that. I think that the belief is whether we're, we're winning, we're behind, that we're going to win a game of football. So um, I think we're heading towards a position where look, we really don't fear anybody. A win against Sparta Prague tomorrow night would give Rangers a good chance of qualifying to the knockout stages. Steve Clark says his Scotland squad must use their final two Euro qualifiers this month to build momentum ahead of next summer's finals in Germany. Clarks named his 23-man squad for the matches against Georgia and Norway. Andy Robertson, Kieran Tierney, Aaron Hickey and goalkeeper Angus Gunn miss out through injury. But there are call-ups for Josh Doig, Anthony Ralston and Robbie McCrory. We identified the, the two games, Georgia away and Norway at home, as, as going to be crucial games in the qualification process. Uh, credit to the players, they've already qualified, so the games are not quite as crucial, but... When you strip it back, we've lost the last three games. Uh, we want to pick up a little bit of momentum going into the, the tournament next summer, so these two games are very important for us. Motherwell manager Stuart Kerrowell says he took his players to task at half-time as the Steelmen fought back from 2-0 down to earn a draw against St Johnson last night. Shane Blaney got the visitors back into the match midway through the second half with this header. Then Mika Beerith equalised for Motherwell with a fine finish. 
it was sheer anger um, at half time. It was anger for the players, but especially anger from myself and the staff. We let ourselves down with two corners into our box. We don't defend them properly. Of course, we make some changes at half time. Uh, we tweak our system, make a substitution. But I'm not necessarily sure that that's the bit that gets you back into the game. I think the players dragged themselves in by making better decisions and by being much, much better in the front foot. And there's one match in the Premiership tonight. Simmern are at home to Hibernian. That is all we spoke tonight. See you again tomorrow. Thanks very much, Raman. Right, let's get the forecast now. It's feeling pretty cold. Here's Sean. An icy start to the day will give way to a series of oohs and ahs. TUI sponsors STV Weather. A very good evening to you. Well, as I said yesterday, we've got some very cold conditions developing to the north of us. We would expect cold weather, but it is a little bit colder than usual. And we could be tapping into some of that cold air in the next couple of days. But don't worry, nothing too extraordinary. It just means we'll have fairly widespread frost by night, especially tomorrow night and Saturday night, probably the coldest nights in the coming days before much milder conditions return into the start of next week. Now, tonight will be chilly enough out there. A few scattered showers in central parts where we've seen a lot of dry weather this afternoon, but a few wee showers over the next couple of hours. But largely for many central, southern, eastern areas, dry, clear spells tonight. A wee touch of frost in the countryside. We'll hang on to most of our shower showers across our Gail and Butte, the Highlands and also into Stirlingshire. Now tomorrow we'll see showers largely across southern parts to start the day and then they'll drift their way northwards into the afternoon but still some fairly decent spells of sunshine and feeling on the chilly side with top temperatures in the afternoon only reaching highs of around 6 or 7 degrees Celsius. Now we go into a northerly airflow on Friday. Of course that's still a chilly airflow. Our high is probably about 7 or 8 degrees Celsius for many of us. But a northerly, a good direction for us because it means largely most of those showers are in northern parts. Although we could see a few around the Hebrides, but plenty of sunshine for many of us. Lanark, one of our chilliest spots in the next couple of nights. We could get lows down to minus two to minus three degrees. Bye-bye. TUI sponsors STV Weather. And finally, that's Halloween and bonfire night out of the way. So, of course, now it's Christmas that's in focus. And already, in what surely is not a marketing ploy, not at all, the top toys for this year have been revealed. Come on, John, where is the Christmas spirit coming Oh, on? it'll come in good time, don't you? <laughs> anyway, Barbie, Harry Potter Lego and Cuddly Squishmallows are all claiming top spots on Santa's list. Our reporter, Laura Piper, has been finding out more. The sound of jingling bells is just round the corner and toy shops like this one have been stocking up. Today, the top 20 toys have been unveiled by industry experts who predict more than a billion pounds will be spent this festive season. It's a list produced for a purpose, you know, so it's produced by the industry of what they hope will basically be the things that sell. It doesn't necessarily reflect what actually will sell and, and we take a different approach to, to basically what we think we would like to see kids to have. One of the products we think will do very well is the Lego Gabby's Doll's House, um, which, which you know, we, we expect big things of. Another area which has seen a tremendous amount of sales over the past year, uh, especially after the movie, is Barbie. Hi Barbie. Thanks to this hit at the box office, Barbie Pop Reveal is top of the toy list, according to Dream Toys, followed by toys ranging in price from an 8 99 Squishmallow to a Harry Potter Hogwarts Castle, coming in at just under £150. As nice as modern toys can be, though, it's still the traditional toys that are capturing children's hearts this Christmas. Um, don't need batteries and, you know, we'll happily engage a child for ages. But if you really want to know what kids want this Christmas, you need to ask the experts. I'd like a Barbie doll. A stationary set. Some more Switch games because I have a Switch. I don't really need anything, right? It's so... I'm so happy with what I have. A sea lion. A sea lion? Like an, an actual a... sea lion. Like a toy oh, sea lion. Oh, well, that sounds like a lovely choice. And, a pa and some passion fruit. Some passion fruits. Mm. For those trying to track down a sea lion or a passion fruit, the advice from experts is to shop early to avoid disappointment or get your letter into Santa nice and early. Laura Piper, STV News. Well, only 47 days to go, John. And you'll want to mark every one of them, won't you? Anyway, <laughs> that's it from us. Good night. Good night.